Hey, Eric, how you doing? Hey, our fitness gorillas are back in town. Well, I hear we have a very, 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 very special guest and a very close friend of yours on today. Tell us a little bit about it. Yep, I couldn't be more happy or honored. We have the number one man in the world, in the fitness world, and he does so many other things. I think he's also running for governor. Let's hope, okay? Mr. Mark Mastrove, his bio, if I read his whole bio, that's the whole show. That's for another episode, but lots are going on now, so we want to get him live. But I'll read a little bit of it about him. So Mark, well, he's done everything. I'll go back to when he was, uh, you know, quite some time ago. Mark and I have been friends and partners for about 25 years. Mark started 24-Hour Nautilus when he was working at one club. He decided to buy that. And then he built it up to 465 locations around the world, everywhere. It was a global company. It was called 24-Hour Fitness. And um, we were at the end of that before Mark masterfully sold it. We were about $180 million in EBITDA, 4 million members. And Mark sold it along with David King, who's going to be on the show in a couple of days, for $1.78 billion, the time the largest ever sale in the fitness industry. But he's done so much more than just that. I mean, he uh, currently is the chairman and lead uh, investor shareholder in Crunch, UFC, Jim's 50% owner. He's the founder and chairman of New Evolution Ventures, which I'm part of as well. And he has clubs all over the world. Alex Rodriguez uh, Energy in Mexico. He's got everything in Australia, UFC, Crunch. Anyway, all over the world. He knows everything about this industry. He's the first one to bring celebrities into it. And, well, I'm going to bring him on because uh, I could talk about him forever and ever and ever. But, again, so honored and proud to have a good friend of mine. God, I'm the godfather of his daughter, even though his wife was horrified when he thought about that. Anyway, a big warm welcome, please, to Mr. Mark Mastrove. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Eric. Howie. I don't know if my wife was. I don't know if my wife was horrified or if you were before uh, you finally broke down and had a child. But uh, I think it was all good. Yeah, I remember getting that phone call. I couldn't believe it, but you bit the bu bullet first, and you have you have a gorgeous family now, and we'll talk about that in a little while. But again, thanks so much, Mark, for coming on. No, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Good to see Howie too. It's been a while since I've yeah, had you. Know, I think the wedding, his wedding. Yeah. So. So actually, you know, we had all these questions, but forget that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why. Can't ask yeah, why. Ask why. Ask immediately. Mark, Mark and I have uh, a, a, a definite law that we don't ask each other why, and that's due to 20 years in Asia. We, we just don't ask why anymore. Plus, Mark's in Russia and many different countries now. Why doesn't really matter. But anyway, okay, Mark, first question. You are great in so many areas of our business. I mean, I've seen you pull off miracles where it came to breaking covenants with banks to our landlord in Korea, where our agent who was translating for us backed up towards the elevator and took off because our landlord at the time was a, a mafia chieftain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen you sell memberships, create everything. You created the dues. You created personal training. But you can do everything. Most people, the good people, are good at some things. But you can do everything. Can you explain that, please? I mean, I don't know if I can do everything. I think that in our industry, it's really interesting because as we all start off with single clubs, you had to do everything. So you had to learn how to do accounting and banking and sales and operations and cleanliness. You kind of had to do a little bit of everything. And then sometimes people found a passion they really liked. I kind of like new challenges. So if something new came about, I didn't understand banking, raising capital, 
um, dealing with, you know, difficult people, difficult situations, whatever it might be. I looked at it as a challenge to get better at, constantly trying to get better and better at what I was doing. So over time, you start to form skills that allow you to do a variety of things. No different than when you were in Asia and you're telling people that, you know, the rents were, you know, kind of high, like $150,000. And people would say, oh, that's not that bad. And you say, well, that's a month, not a year, but a month and, you know, 350000 a month. So it's, it's really just getting to a point where you overcome, you know, the situation and get better at it and apply it in the future so that you have 10, 20, 30 years experience. You pretty soon have seen almost everything and can give people good advice that they can put to work. Well, I've seen you do some miracles besides selling 24 for $1.8 billion. Um, you've been through it all. And I'm going to ask you a little bit later, a little bit about some spiritual stuff not really spiritual, but your special powers that I know that you have. But one of the things that I've seen you, geez, we've been working together for 25 years. I've only seen you really get mad one time. And that was when Bill Dobbins, our CFO in Asia, <laughs> I forget what it was, but I think it was the only time that you ever lost your cool. That's why I personally named you Mr. Freeze. What about that? Tell me about that. Well, I mean, you know, I I grew up, uh, you know, in a community that was very sports oriented. And so I played a lot of sports and, and you learned pretty quickly that you had to kind of keep your cool. You couldn't let people take you off your game. So I was always very focused on being you know, relaxed and in control and not giving up my cool unless I absolutely had to. And it was to an advantage. And occasionally you lose your temper. Occasionally you'll get upset. Occasionally you'll be disappointed. But I've always found that, you know, you can push through it. And, and if you keep your cool, you keep relaxed, you keep everybody around you uh, relaxed as well so that everybody doesn't kind of go off in the wrong directions. But, you know, it's it's always challenging to kind of keep things in control. But I, I do believe that it allows you to kind of stay in that meditative state that you like so that, you know, everything is is uh, is balanced in life. And I think that's really important to have great balance. You have to be, you know, really, really good um, at work. You have to be really uh, good in your community. You have to be great at home. And, and that's what you always try and strive for. Well, you've done that. And by the way, Bill Dobson's a really great CFO and a good friend still. But yeah, Bill, Bill's great. I, Bill and I probably email, if it's not every week, it's every other week. So he and I stay in touch all the time. Love Bill. He's great. And he and I have had a lot of fun sc screaming at each other when we needed to and having, you know, debates over uh, financing. So he, he's yeah. a sharp guy and a fun guy. Yeah, one of the geniuses. How are you? Yeah, Mark, I have a couple of questions for you myself. Um, I just before the, the broadcast, I was just watching Fox News, my favorite channel, and they just interviewed a fellow from, uh, I guess it was Oceanside, California. He owns a gym called Metroflex. Arrested, like kind of pounded out. Very, very bad situation. And he was on there talking about that there are quite a few clubs that are opening, whether the law says it or not, in California. If you were on the fence about opening now, what do you do? What would you do? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, Cal California's been pretty tough on reopening their their businesses and, and the state. Uh, I think our governor here has been focused on his political aspirations running for president. That's my view, my personal view. And while he's trying to do what's best for the people in the state of California, he's been very slow at it. So uh, I get that. That's his decision. We support it best we can. But you know, ultimately the gyms now are in what they call phase three. And then yesterday or day before yesterday, he, he announced, actually I think it was, it was uh, yeah, was it Monday? Monday he announced that, you know, phase three should open within weeks. So we think in the next two to three weeks, gyms will slowly be in to open in the counties that will allow them to, which is probably the vast majority of the counties in the state. And, you know, people can start to get back a little bit. You know, the issue for all of us is from the day we close, middle of March to the day you open, maybe it's the beginning or middle of June, you know, what, what happens to your member base and, you know, have they stayed around? Are they, are they willing to come back? Are they afraid to come back, et cetera? The gyms that have opened in states to date have seen uh, pretty strong workouts and, and strong sales where people want to get back to fitness because one thing that we all recognize is the only vaccine today that's recognized is exercise. And included in exercise is lifting weights, you know, and getting your muscles to fatigue a little bit and, and, and be uh, pressed a little bit. So a lot of the reports coming out, whether it's from the, the government, the CDC, you read everything in there and says, you definitely need to exercise. You definitely need to lift weights. And so I think, you know, ultimately if we can get the States back open and we can start to get society moving a little bit, 
you know, wear masks, wear gloves if you want to, wash your hands, you know, 20 seconds, soap and water, warm water. Don't touch your face, your eyes, nose, mouth. Don't touch it. You know, stay away from people's social distancing. If we do the right things, we should be able to hopefully, you know, put this virus into either herd immunity or behind us here in the, in the summer months ahead and slowly kind of get back to a, a reasonable pace of life. And hopefully that helps the gym industry because people do recognize they need to get back exercising and into our gyms, not staying at home. And I support home exercise. That's always been part of our mantras. Work out at home if you can. And if you find a software you like or a platform you like, great. But nothing better than getting in a gym with your community, with your family, your friends, and exercising, laughing, having fun, pushing each other, and working out by yourself at home or online. Right. Uh, nothing. I have a follow-up question. Um, we saw uh, on Monday, we were talking to Curtis Harmon. I'm sure you know him, obviously. Um, he was saying that in some jurisdictions where he is like, or maybe he just heard about it, I forget. In Colorado, they're telling people that they can open their gym. They can only have 10 people in there at one time. And it's not even regarding whether uh, they have a 10,000 square foot place or a 50,000 square foot place. How do you deal with ridiculous government uh, edicts at this time? I mean, what do you do? Yeah, great question. I mean, most states, let's say 90% are going with either one per 200 square feet or 25% of capacity. So if your workout floor has a code of 400 people, then you can have capacity of 100 uh -huh. at that time. And so some gyms are basically creating an app where you can register for the hour that you want to work out or the hour and a half. And then they put 100 people in for that hour and a half. And then when you're done, they take 30 minutes to clean their gym and bring everybody back. Uh, others are having people, you know, clean the equipment before and after as well as staff. You know, all the reports show that sweat does not pass the virus. So right. sweat is really not an issue. We've always been good in our industry at cleaning, you know, our equipment. When someone sweats on it, you've got bottles, spray bottles, bring a towel, wipe it down, et cetera. But at this time, you have to do a lot more to get people to feel comfortable so that the virus doesn't spread. But a lot of reports have come out now. Wear a mask reduces the virus spread if someone is coughing or sneezing, which most of us aren't because you won't go to the gym if you have that, you know, kind yeah, of. Better not, yeah. You're not going to show up. But if you're coughing and sneezing, 75% reduction by wearing a mask. So, you know, I think we're in pretty good shape. If, if Colorado's going 10 people maximum in group settings, that just probably means the gyms aren't ready to open yet because every state I've seen, the classification for gyms is generally between 25 and 50%. So some states are 50% of capacity, some are at 25%. Um, the classrooms, uh, a lot of them are six feet social distancing. So classrooms are you know, 10 to 15 people in, in a large square uh, footage area, and they're starting to teach classes in places. You know, The smaller gyms are, are gonna have to take a little bit longer to kind of get back because if you've got a spin studio that's 2,000 square feet, yeah. you've only, you're only gonna be able to put in capacity of 25%. That might only be six to eight people. So you just might have to teach more classes instead of having three classes a day with, you know, 30 people in it. You might have to have six classes a day with, you know, six to eight, 10 people in it, depending on what your codes are. So I do think there's ways to work through it. And as confidence builds up and people start to recognize getting back to exercise is super important, then I, I think we'll thrive. One last uh, question on that subject. We, we had uh, uh, Craig on the other day, Craig Pepandona, and he was talking about all the, the efforts that Crunch has made to, you know, for security of the members and the staff. Um, apparently the staff will be wearing masks, but what about the members? What do you think? Should we ask them to wear, wear masks? Should they not have to wear masks? This is the question. It goes to what you just said. It helps cut the spread. I mean, if just the staff are wearing it and there's enough members around, the droplets apparently can travel 12 feet or I don't know. Um, what's the idea? Can you ask your members to wear it? That's the question I have. Well, most of the time you're going to resolve to what the requirements are by the, the, either the state, the city, the county. And what we've seen in most of the counties is that they're requiring masks. So in Texas, they're requiring that you wear a mask when you exercise at this time. And, and in, in time, they'll probably maybe pull that away. But all of our members are actually required to have gloves on in Texas and masks. And so the members, you know, the first day, I think we opened one of our gyms in Texas. We did about 800 workouts and everybody wore masks and gloves. They were cool with it. They were fine with it. Happy to get, able to get a workout in. In time, I think that'll change up and, and loosen. But for now, we just follow the procedures and, you know, people adjust. They, they work through it. Right. Mark, what would you say, Mark, to 
somebody who's not sure about reopening. They're not a chain. They're by themselves. Maybe they're looking for money. They're looking for a partner. They're looking for a better way to reopen. How would they go about that? What would you recommend to them? Well, I mean, it'd be good if they could open just so they can have a precedent to say that, look, we, we had a member base of X. We reopened two months later and had a member base of Y. Our cancellations weren't very heavy. Uh, people are willing to pay. We sold new memberships. And so our business looks like it's rebounding well. We would like to raise some additional capital. And, you know, based on, on their current capital structure, they would maybe go out and say they need, call it half a million dollars, just making a number up. They would say our business is worth $2 million right now under this pretense and we're willing to sell 25% of the company for half a million dollars to give us a little bit of re breathing room and a little bit of extra cash on the balance sheet to protect us as we go forward. Um, a lot of it just boils down to, you know, how many members come back and what percentages come back. It's early days, you know, from what I've seen around the country from people I've talked to is that there has not been really high cancellations. It's been pretty good. And there's been really strong sales for people coming back. So, you know, there's a chance that, you know, you may not suffer as much as you think. Uh, time will tell. But there's a good chance that I think everybody will recover pretty well, provided they can get up and running quickly. You know, places like California, which may take longer, uh, Hawaii, which are looking at two or three months before gyms can get open. You know, maybe there'll be less members there. But other states that have opened within 60 days have, have performed pretty well. Yeah. Our contacts in Asia have been telling me that they're at 90 percent capacity and new member sales are even better than pre-virus. So that's very exciting and encouraging, but they don't have the media, the media situation that we have. Yeah, that's that, true. You know, that's a big part of it, I think. It, it's, I mean, it, it's, to the media standpoint, it's kind of like when Trump's impeachment started off, everybody was watching. By the time it finished, nobody was watching. And I think, you know, I find myself not watching the news anymore because it's just so sensationalized, so inaccurate, and they're they're running around to stories that aren't worth listening to. That I just read and try to understand what the most you know pertinent information is or most recent information is, and just try and stay more focused on the positive. Right. It's kind of like when people come out and make speeches that the world is ending. You just got to throw that out and not listen to it because it's not accurate. The, the numbers that they threw out early on where millions and millions of people were going to die in the U.S. and in Canada just didn't come out to be true. And, uh, you know, we have to recognize everybody's working with, you know, improper database and the models aren't very accurate right now, but you know, it, it's a, it's a terrible flu, a terrible pandemic. And a lot of people have passed that should not have way earlier than they should have. But now that we're starting to understand it better and get our hands around it, I think we're as a society starting to do a better job at keeping those that need to stay at home, you know, and protected at home and, and away from risk. And those that are healthy that can get out there and, and deal with the virus if they had to, you know, trying to get back to life while protecting themselves with, you know, face masks, gloves if they want to wear them, and then social distancing. Right. Well, I was going to say that as far as news goes, you still have your National Enquirer subscription, right? <laughs> of course. I mean, that's the only place you learn anything. <laughs> All right. I have a question, Eric. Uh yeah, I see we have a question. I just uh, have you guys ran, okay, have you guys run into price increase due to the capacity limitations? That's a good question, Mark. Yeah, we haven't we haven't done anything on pricing. We felt like we wanted to protect our members and it's very early days. I mean, barely been open a couple of weeks probably at the longest in any of our markets. So, you know, for now we've kept pricing down. Uh, I do think that in time if this is here to stay where you have limits on the number of people that can come into your facilities, and maybe that's around 50% of normal, then you may have to set up a registration system where people can book their appointments and come in at certain times that they're comfortable with and they can exercise and head home and you can clean and bring the next set in. Uh, that may be the direction to go, but you know, nothing on pricing yet. It's a, it's an idea to think about if the member base is willing to do it again, depending on your competitive landscape, where you operate and live. So, you know, one thing we may see is, you know, a certain number of facilities that don't reopen, which could bode well for those that do. So you may want to protect your member base with good pricing versus, you know, a little bit higher pricing. But if you're at $20, you want to go to 25. If you're at nine, you want to go to hundred. It, it may not be a big issue for new members coming in, or if you want to raise dues with your current members, it may not be a big issue as well. Right. And, uh, and Eric, let me ask him a question. Uh, that's a good point about other clubs closing down and, and losing their members. 
What do you see as the as the landscape right now? I mean, what kind of percentage? We've asked everybody that's been on. What kind of percentage of clubs do you think will not reopen? Yeah, great question. I mean, you've seen, you know, in some markets that we've opened up, a lot of people have waited to open. Um, they weren't ready, you know, to train their staff and implement new procedures and make sure they got their heat guns to check temperatures at the door to make sure they had masks and gloves and things in place and solutions that they need to have product wise. So some have delayed to open. So you can't tell if they can open a little bit later, but there's definitely been a shutdown from some of the major chains where they have not launched uh, some of their clubs. And there's definitely been a couple of chains that are thinking about re or filing such as, as Gold's Gyms and others that have filed bankruptcy and may not open all of their product. Uh, but, you know, the, the area that I, I worry a little bit about is just the boutiques because their floor plate's so small. Are they going to be able to get enough people in there right now to make the classes worthwhile? I, I think they can, but it, it's just hard to say based on their footprint, you know, the number of people they can put in with this social distancing aspect to continue to get the business to, to thrive. So at the end of the day, Howie, it's going to boil down to, Good relationships with your landlords because that's probably your biggest yeah. you cut every month other than your salaries those two components keeping your labor as, as lean as you can to operate and then making sure that your landlords want to help you out and work with you as you kind of come through this period of time yeah, yeah about the boutiques and, and your price increase i can't pencil down how they can't in, increase their their prices per class because as you mentioned, I mean, you're talking about some major brands. Soul Psycho, what, what's their average footprint? 3,500 square feet? You know, 45, 50, 50 bikes? If they can only have 12, 13 bikes, they're already back to back in classes. You know, for sure, 435, 36, 37, 38, 30 in the morning, 7, 8, 9, 10. They already have that. I, I can't see how they, without almost doubling their price per class, they're going to take major hits. Yeah, I mean, you know, fortunately, it's, you know, Equinox owns it, and, and Harvey's one of the best operators in the world. So he and his team will navigate it. They'll figure it out, and they'll, they'll, they'll survive and do fine. Um, but, you know, it's going to take time. Every, every state, every city, everybody's doing it a little bit differently, and some states are delegating to the counties. And so take California's example. You know, Governor Newsom said, I'm going to let the counties make the decisions here on – whether they're ready to open based on science and statistics. And so the state of California has 58 counties. So you have 58 decision makers, and then you have health experts in all those constituencies of 58 health experts. And then you've got board of supervisors. So the decision making can be really bifurcated to understand what your county's ready to do and willing to do. But right now it looks like what you're seeing is 25% capacity generally around the health and fitness space or one per 200 square feet is allowed, including a lot of times staff. And so the classes are going to be smaller and it's going to be tougher to hold those for a period of time. But as the gyms perform better, I think it'll lift to eventually 50%, which will then help the boutiques. So the boutiques should be cheering on the gyms because at least they're getting in a higher volume of people. And the more success they have with people coming in and out without anybody pointing to a, a virus issue, yeah. So we'll all get back. Right. We have another question now. We have another question from Mark. Do you feel, this is from a Mark Sab. do you feel RFID and QR contact list check-ins are, are going to be important moving forward? I, I, it's a good question. I, I think they will be. I think in all businesses they could be. I was, I was talking to somebody uh, a couple of days ago that said that there's a device coming out of Israel that you can breathe into a tube and then that tube would go into a device that would register whether you had COVID or not within a very short period of time, maybe seconds. And ultimately that would give you the pass, go or no go. And so that would help lead towards, you know, people being able to go to sporting events or getting into higher volume situations. I think, I think there'll be more and more things coming out that'll measure your temperature, your ability to um, have a virus or sickness and, and be able to come in or not come in. Yeah. As we know, you know, Eric knows, and even how you know, having worked in Asia, the, the culture in Asia has always been, you know, I, I need to protect you from me. So if I had a cold or a cough, I'd put a mask on and then I would go out to work or out, out in the streets and go to shop. And I put the mask on, not because I had a cold and I was required, but I didn't want you to catch my cold. 
in the United States, if somebody had a cold or flu and you're on an airplane or in a school or something, they'd be coughing all over you all day and you'd be sitting there. My wife would be like huddled in the corner because, you know, Mindy's always afraid of somebody coughing on her and giving her a virus. So she, she was always the best at protecting herself. And so it'll change now. It's going to change where if you have a cold or a cough, if you don't feel well, you're just not going to leave your house. You're not going to go to work. They're going to tell you to stay home. You're not going to go to the gym. You're not going to go to the grocery store unless you absolutely have to. And you're going to wear like six masks so nobody catches anything. And I think that that's going to help us protect ourselves from the spread of disease into perpetuity, where Asia had this already down for decades. And, and the United States has always been a little bit about, you know, I don't really care. I'm not going to put a mask on because I look stupid. Now everybody has a mask on and everybody can go, you know, back out and protect themselves against others and vice versa now, which I think is going to be great. Yeah, and you know, on, the, on the airplanes, there have been a few fights because people wouldn't stop coughing. They weren't wearing masks, and the other passengers ganged up on them, and then it was a whole big, big area, right? Because some yeah. are packing the planes very close now. Yeah, and they're no, all wearing Louis Vuitton masks and Hermes masks. Yeah, so that you know, I, I remember being in SARS in Hong Kong, two thousand and three, and everyone was wearing masks everywhere. That was the first pandemic we've been through. Um, I remember getting a tip from one of the other reporters that the next day, the South China Morning Post, the newspaper of Hong Kong, was going to come out with a statement that they believe SARS can be spread through sweat. And I got on the phone and I said, wait a minute, if you don't have the fact of that, we just spent $5 million on our central club. If you, if you don't have a fact about that solid proof, you're just going to kill the entire industry. And I don't know how I did it, or maybe other people as well, but we shut that down. Can you imagine if that was the headlines? Well, it's like today, there's so much information coming out that's inaccurate and yeah. you know, so many hoaxes and, and, and bad information, as Trump always calls it, fake news, whatever, that's really hard to read through the lines on what's reality, what's not reality. I think that some countries have done a phenomenal job with the virus. I, I look at Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan. They've been able to really ring fence it, corral it, and bring it down and reduce it to next to nothing very quickly. And those are centralized governments that can create policy and execute. We're very decentralized in the United States and to a certain degree in Canada. And so you know, the United States has done um, not as strong of a job probably as Canada or Australia and others. And so the virus spreads and social media spreads and rumor and innuendo spread and people start thinking things that aren't true. And you got Gavin Newsom coming out from California saying that my statistics show that 26 million Californians will get the virus and at least 3 million are going to die unless we, you know, ring fence and, and shelter in for a long period of time. And all of a sudden you start to realize a lot of that just isn't true. It's, it's creating a lot of anxiety where it didn't need to if we had to run it properly like, like Australia did where – they're down to single digits today in a $25 million population base. And they're moving very quickly to get back to 100%. Mm -hmm. And Taiwan never even shut. Taiwan, yeah. uh, gyms have ne were never told to, to close. So there, there you go. With all that talk about you know governments and stuff, I heard from some sources, Adam Sedlock and some others, that you may be considering running for governor. Well, I mean, we got in this big debate based on the way that our governor has been running everything. And I, I wasn't too happy about it, as are a lot of people in this state. And I said, well, if it takes me to step up and fill that shoe in a couple of years when the, the, the uh, you know contest for governor comes up again, I'll be open minded to it. I mean, I've been asked a ton of times. I've never really been a big political guy. But, you know, we're, we're running the, the state as a as a political state. And that's just not fair. And it's not right. That's just my opinion. I don't think Gavin's running it with the best interests here. If if the uh, governors of other states have opened up and been aggressive to get you know, the economies back and Gavin's taking the position that we're not going to do that, we're going to take a lot longer in California, even though our numbers are probably some of the best in the world sure when it comes to the number of, of positive cases and, and deaths, you know, it's, it's hard for me to get excited about the way that the direction of the state's going. And now we're looking at a deficit in the budget that's climbing towards $100 billion, which is is just scary and unemployment. So I don't know that California ran the right play. And I think you need someone with some business experience and the ability to lead versus somebody who wants to pass the buck. And for our governor to say that this state's going to run through its counties and not the governor, like other states have said, the governor's going to run the state. 
just means to me that, you know, you're not willing to lead. You're not willing to take ownership of your state, which obviously if I was in his seat would not have happened. I would not have let that happen. Well, let me be official. I'm putting in my. Sounds like a yeah. To be your campaign manager. All right. You know, he, the point he makes is exactly what we were talking about with Curtis the other day also. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice if the person running and making these decisions, running the government, making these decisions, actually had some experience running a business, paying a payroll, paying their rent? None of these guys ever did anything other than maybe they became a lawyer. That's about it. Yeah, Mark would be great be, businessman. Yeah. yeah, to execute, I mean, there's three simple things that everybody wanted to do. They want to execute on testing, which to me is just like a business. You get it up and running and you, you get it done. And that isn't that hard. For us not to be able to do 60,000 tests a day in California still three months in is ridiculous. Um, second piece is, you know, they want to be able to do tracing. And so they're working with Google and, and uh, Apple and creating a tracing app and putting that all in place. What you saw is Australia said, we need tracing too. So one weekend they went to Singapore and said, you guys already built a tracing app. Can we buy it off of you? And Singapore sold it to them for a song, a very low price. And Australia put the tracing app in and had 11 million people download it. And they've got tracing in place. We're still not even there yet in California, let alone will Californians allow you to have tracing. I don't even know. But you know, would I let somebody trace me? Sure. If, if I'm someplace and, you know, I end up with the virus or somebody else had the virus that was nearby, I'd want to know. So there are simple things to do. And then, and then the third piece is, you know, creating balance between closures and openings and, and, and setting businesses up for success. You know, we had all the essential workers working this entire period of time and they're churning the virus, getting to herd immunity because they're the only ones that are being exposed. And so there's been just a set, steady flow of people with the virus, those that need to go to the hospital and those who get out. And then, uh, you know, a few people, unfortunately, that are passing from it. And so we just need to do a better job at integrating more people into that essential group versus very small group, because now you're going to bring everybody back out. And I don't know if you accomplished what you really thought you were going to accomplish. So simple things can be done to make things better politically, but we can talk politics all day long. I don't know if that's what you want to talk about right now. Well, no, but I think you've been a great governor, but it leads into another question. So, Mark, you've been so successful for decades in the fitness industry. What keeps you still here? I mean, you own NBA basketball team, which was one of your dreams. Uh, you said that a long time ago when you, you weren't able to buy it, but you were set on it. You've got an uh, incredible family. I mean, every one of your kids are phenomenal. They're either getting scholarships to any university they want for basketball for football you know my goddaughter Mia is the, one of the greatest teenage basketball players and a supermodel you, you have that family you have the the uh, you built the arena for your for your Sacramento Kings magnificent arena that wasn't easy you're an owner of the NBA plus so many things you haven't told me about because you never talk I always have to find out and dig in for information what keeps you going, really? What keeps you going in the fitness industry? Well, I mean, I love the fitness industry. Somebody, I mean, somebody told me a long time ago, when you get really good at something, just stay with it. You know, it takes decades to really get good at something, maybe 10 years for everything that you do. And so my, my view was here in the fitness industry that I finally started to figure it out. And I always kind of call it cracking the code to a certain degree. And, you know, you and Eric, you and I barnstorm all over the world, all over Asia, you know, learning a lot, opening in countries, starting businesses that didn't exist and, and, and building the fitness industry, which you did a phenomenal job at. And I just kind of followed you around and helped where I could. But ultimately, I just love the industry. I love the challenge. I've always felt it's super important. I felt that, you know, we're an essential industry. I think government and a lot of people just don't understand. I think members do. Uh, you know, 20 percent of the people in most states exercise in gyms on average. And so those people get it that we're very essential to keeping people healthy, reducing health care costs and, and keeping people focus on longevity and feeling good and getting those endorphins running. And so I just love the, love the business, love the industry. And I love the challenges that it presents. Even at this time, I just love the challenge every day of trying to figure out how do we get through this because it's not easy. And uh, what are we going to do? And how do we have conversations with our landlords, our members, our staff? You know, we've had to furlough a lot of people, thousands of people because no revenue coming in. And, you know, I want to make sure that we take care of them, make sure they get the CARES Act, make sure that they get funded through unemployment and we put all the information out so everybody can try and be helped. You know, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting time, but I'm always motivated because I, I love what I do. Um, you know, and you get into, you know, 
Kings basketball and NBA. That was always a goal of mine for a long time. We can talk about that maybe another time, but you know, it's been a very fun uh, opportunity and, and really exciting. And then, you know, your family, you give all that you can to your family. And so, you know, my wife, Minnie's done an amazing job, you know, helping raise our kids. And, and we do have four great kids who work really hard, you know, in school and, and uh, in sports and anything that they do. And, you know, I think it's all about the effort you put in, just like in life. You know, the, the harder you work, if you're the hardest working person in the room, then generally you're going to excel. And I also I think you're very responsible for the the thousands of staff that count on you. I think that may be one of the things that keeps you in the box. Yeah, I think I think that's true. I mean, I, you get a strong work ethic. I mean, my mom and my dad both worked really hard to to – help get me through school and, and help me learn as I grew up, you know, my dad put in long hours and my, my mom was at home and then she used to work you know, as well. And so you kind of see the, the work that they put in, you, you, you benchmark yourself off your, your, your parents. And I know that they, they, you know, came from very little um, and they worked very hard to, to achieve what they achieved in life. And, and they wanted us to achieve as well. So my two sisters and I were always pushed and driven to, to be as successful as we could be. And I think that's that work ethic that you build. And it's the same thing I try to instill in, in my children. And in today's world, it's, it's, it's hard, you know, to, to motivate the kids, you know, this new generation here. And I found that sports is a place that really can drive you to compete. And it's the one area that I think, you know, with your kids it is a spot that they learn. It's the great equalizer. Either they're going to put the work in and excel or they're not. And I think it's fun to watch that, that kind of evolve. And as my kids have been, really focus on competing, you know, whether it's in the classroom or with their friends or in sport, that's kind of the foundation that they'll build, that they'll take into life as they get into the workplace. Right. And man, one of your kids is also a genius besides all the athletes. So I've watched it from Mindy being pregnant all the way to today. So, so back to another question. I remember way back, you were talking about, you wanted to own a professional team and you talked about basketball because you know, you love all the sports, but basketball is one of your favorites. So you never talk about any type of powers. You know, I'm crazy. I'm always looking at for what's behind the curtain, what's on the other side of life. You never talk about meditation or any of your teachers or any teachings, any yoga techniques. You never talk about that. But you visualize these things, obviously. You talked about owning an NBA team many, many years ago. So take us from your, I don't remember, I met you when you were in your late 20s, I think. And no, early, yeah, in late, early 30s, late 20s. And you had already made the statement, I'm going to get about, I'm going to own an NBA basketball team. What were the steps you did besides, you, like you said, you're working 20 hours a day. We get that. We know how hard you work. We know how smart you are. Put that aside. What did you do special to, 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 from visualizing it to having it become a reality? Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I think a lot of it's just that you set goals that don't seem attainable or achievable for yourself that are, are kind of out there a little bit. We used to call them in our, in the old 24 hour days, we used to call them the BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goals, goals that are just going to be tough to get to. And I know that, you know, the story I used to always tell is that, you know, when I was a young boy, I played basketball. My dad was a basketball player at Cal and, and I used to always aspire to be a basketball player and play in college. And you dream when you're a kid, you might be able to play in the NBA at that time. And so uh, I remember my dad enrolled me to go to a, a Rick Barry basketball camp. Rick Barry was the big hero in the Bay Area at the time. They'd won a championship uh, NBA title, and he'd been retired. So I showed up at his camp, and I busted ass, and I worked my ass, uh, ass off the entire camp. It was like a week long, and I made the all-star team, and I led the team in scoring, and I was like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a player. I thought I was pretty good. And then at the end of the camp, you know, Rick Barry came up, and he gave this big speech, and in his speech he said, you know, there's – two or 300 kids, I think, in the camp. He said, look, look at all of the kids. Look around at everybody in this entire room here. Not a single one of you will ever play in the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. So, track. I think I might have been 10 years old, 11 years old at the time, and it just, like, crushed me. I was like, what? I can't play in the NBA? And he, he went on to say that the odds of making the NBA was like 0.2% and no one ever makes it unless you're six foot 10, you're not going to get there. So 
you know, play basketball for fun, but, you know, be smart, go to school, that whole routine. That was his message. He just crushed me. So I remember I went home practically in tears and, and uh, I told my dad what happened. And my dad said, well, I mean, you know, maybe he's right. It's hard to make the NBA, but hey, maybe one day you could own an NBA team. And so that went into my head when I was a, a little boy. And, and I just had it in my head all along that maybe one day I'll, I'll own an NBA team. And that was my goal. And so that's kind of materialized. It was always in the back of my mind, Eric. And I always thought about it. And, and as I had a little bit more success in life and I, I started studying the NBA and I spent times with athletes and, and players and owners and got to meet people as 24 Hour Fitness used to sponsor, you know, stadiums. I'd go sit with people and ask questions. I started realizing maybe that could be something that it could become reality. And then fortunately I had a chance to invest in a team and it did. So a lot of it's just aspiring for something that is a really a stretch goal and you try and get after it and try and focus on it. So some of it's meditating, it's constantly thinking about it, it's finding ways. And a big part of it is again, just kind of slowly finding your way to an outcome that others may not try for or achieve or, or really put the effort in. And, and you know me, I'm like a, a dog with a bone. If I get after something, I'm going to get after it and I'm going to work really hard and I'm going to, I'm going to try and, you know, excel and achieve to get there. And there's nothing I think that can't happen. So with hard work, determination, energy and effort. There's nothing I think anybody can't do. I never say never. Just I just don't. Yeah, well, you, you've proven that. And you touched on, I wanted to ask you another question about the celebrities that you have in your life. I mean, you're a celebrity too. And, and you were the first one to start. I mean, you saw that having celebrities attached to the brand at the time of 24-hour Nautilus, even before 24-hour, you connected with, all the biggest names. I mean, Shaq O'Neal, Andre uh, Agassi. Who, you had them all, actually. What was it that made you a feel that that was something very important, which it turned out you were completely right? And in your life, you seem to attract them all. They they're very comfortable with you. I mean, you, on your cell phone, you have everybody in the world's uh, phone number on it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah, I mean. I'd say that I give the credit to, to Irvin Magic Johnson, who, you know, I knew, I knew Irvin from his playing days and at, at the Lakers, we used to sponsor Lakers. And, you know, I had a little bit of a relationship with him where I could say hello and, and chat uh, occasionally. And then, you know, one day he called me long after he'd retired and said that he just put a deal together with Howard Schultz to do some Starbucks, that they were going to be joint venture partners. And he really thought that, you know, he wanted to do the same thing with a fitness company and thought of me and, he was focused on the inner cities, kind of working inner cities where they were underserved. And I said, hey, great idea. So we, we began on what we were going to do as a partnership, but eventually became more of a royalty program. And we put Irvin's name and co-branded our gyms. It was like 24 Hour Fitness by Magic Johnson. And we opened a couple of them to see what would happen towards, you know, inner cities. And in the first couple of openings, I would go into the gyms. I just walk around and I would hear the members say, I can't believe this is Magic's gym. It's amazing. I mean, I'm so happy. It's the reason I joined here. And what you started to realize is that you kind of broke through the clutter a little bit and that people saw 24 Hour Fitness and they loved that, but they also saw their hero, Magic Johnson, was involved and they loved him. And your member base kind of grew a little bit. And then it, it kind of also broke through the clutter in your advertising when all of a sudden Magic's picture was in, in the press. So at the time, we had Cindy Crawford, if you remember, Eric. She was one of our, our spokespeople. Oh, I, I, I think I remember. Yeah, I know you do. And she um, she was on the board of directors. I asked her to, to join our board. She was kind enough to do it, and she was amazing, super lady, really, really smart. And we would do photo shoots, and I did a photo shoot with her and Magic Johnson uh, with basketball and tuxedos and you know all these crazy props. And, and we ran advertising campaigns that just people went crazy for. So you started to recognize that if you had the right spokespeople that that could help elevate your brand and share with them that it took you to another level. And so, you know, the phone started ringing after Magic's uh, gyms were successful, then calls came in from other people. We weren't reaching out really. And, you know, we formed partnerships with a few others. And we had a lot of fun in Asia with Jackie Chan and did a bunch of gyms with Jackie and they were amazing. So it, it just kind of helped us break through the clutter. And then it was fun. Our team loved it. Our staff loved it. Our members loved it. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the call them the actors, actresses, athletes, celebrities, as you would, loved it. And it was a very symbiotic, uh, symbiotic, you know, hand in glove kind of relationship that, that worked really well. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, another question, Mark. Uh, maybe we could see it. Well, again, from Mark Sab. 
During this time, many fitness buffs are working out at home using Zoom and FaceTime for PT. Would having a live stream for Group X classes as an add-on to a membership, to membership dues, be beneficial for members reluctant to come back to the gyms? Yeah, I think I think everybody's heading that way. If they didn't already have it, they they have it now. I think being able to communicate with your members, with your favorite instructor, favorite personal trainer, whether it's streaming through Instagram or Zoom or any device, YouTube, I think it's really great. It should be part of, of the offering. A lot of the big chains have developed huge digital platforms and make them available to our members so they can download exercise programs they can trace and track at home or in the gym or on the road, wherever they're at. So I think it's, it's smart. And if you don't have it now, I'd recommend that you do. Okay. Good. Let's keep going. Um, when I think back, Mark, at everyone that's worked, worked with you in whatever capacity, so many of them have gone on to own their own companies, their own clubs, franchises of yours or whatever. They've gone on to be CEOs of so many, uh, very, not even just in our industry. So how do you find these people, these superstars that – you can kind of pick out of the crowd. What do you look for and how does it progress with this group of people versus all the rest? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, there, there, there's people that seek you out that want to learn and, and excel and get better at what they do. And so sometimes it's just building a relationship. But for me, it's a lot around trust and loyalty and then putting in the, the effort. And then I want to make sure that, you know, I, I'm there for you. So I've always believed that the pyramid is kind of upside down, that I work for you and I'm on the bottom and I work for everybody up through the structure so that I can help you achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. And so I've been fortunate that great leaders have come along over the years, the decades that you have a chance to work with, whether it's, you know, the, the original crews, the uh, Don Harbicks, the John Romeos, the, the David Tensios of the day. The, the, the new crews, the Jim Rollies, who's CEO of Crunch, who's phenomenal. The Mike Feeney's, who, you know, have been amazing. Um, Mike, you know, runs construction and, and uh, all the kind of uh, FF&E equipment purchasing, et cetera. There's nobody better in the world. So you get lucky to have somebody alongside you like that. And then you, you've got the, you know, the, the legacy guys that have all kind of come out, the, the Curtis Harmons, you know, the, the Mark Pollys of the world, the Adam Sedlocks, who's phenomenal. Um, running business units, they're, they're all great at what they do. And then you, know, you got the young guys, you know, the the Brian Calgaris that have come out. You know, Kim Funk's amazing out there in Texas. Uh, Johnny Delavondane. I mean, it's you just find good people. You have their back. They have yours. You stay loyal to them. They stay loyal to you. You you talk to them. You communicate. You make sure you give them all that they need to be successful. And then you let them run. You know, the, the one thing I, I always tell everybody is I have a lot of trust. And as long as you keep my trust, you can do whatever it is you need to do to be successful. And I've got your back. I'm not going to micromanage anybody. It's just not my style. I mean, the, the Brian Bowman's of the world that came into 24 fitness and elevated themselves to presidents, you know, were truly amazing. The, the Ben Midgley's who have come in and run and built a whole franchise company at crunch with Craig Pepper and I, you know, they're just only a handful of guys like that that could do it in the whole world. You know, and Craig's been with me, gosh, since the nineties. I mean, Craig came in as, a president, 24 Nautilus, and then went all the way through the family fitness acquisitions and became obviously a VP, SVP of marketing and sales for the whole world at one time. So if you find good people, you let them run, you let them elevate, you let them grow, and you continue to challenge them. And I, I always tell the story of Steve Kleinfelter, where Steve was kind of a district manager for us in uh, the United States at 24 Hour. And he just came to my office one day and said, look, Mark, I'm, I'm looking for a challenge. I want something bigger, better. And I said to him, I said, well, you're looking for something that's kind of like a, you know, a, a small challenge, a big challenge. You're looking for like an atomic bomb, kind of amazing challenge. What are you looking for? He goes, I want, I want the big challenge. So I said, all right, well, why don't you pick up your family and move out to Asia and go work with Eric? <laughs> and Steve, <laughs> Steve got floored. And, and I think a day later, he called me back and says, all right. I talked to my wife. We're ready. And we transferred Steve out there to Hong Kong. And, you know, this, this kid from Iowa is all of a sudden the, uh, became the president of Asia and, and did a phenomenal job. So, you know, I can talk about people for, for hours, the stories, and we can laugh and talk about the, the fun times, the, the interesting times. But you too, Eric, have had a phenomenal run at, at developing amazing people. The, the John Franklins of the world who you brought out to Asia, who end up owning big companies and developing them in Malaysia and Indonesia and places that none of us ever thought could be big fitness hubs. So, you know, it, it's a lot about, you know, 
preparation and opportunity. But I, I believe in people. I think everybody can get it done if they really are passionate about wanting to get it done. And, and if they are, then you just give them the, the opportunity and, and, and they'll rise to the occasion. Well, I'm glad you chose that Steve Kleinfelter story. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, I love you. You know that, right? Steve's been a friend of mine forever since we had those uh, family fitness center partner meetings where we both, when the wrong question came to Ray Wilson, still our mentor, we would go <laughs> underneath the desk because Ray's fire would travel across the room. So we went below the desk. We knew when to duck. So we had we had times like that. How about partners? How what do you look for in a partner? You got a lot. Yeah, it's a good question. It depends on it depends on your needs. So if it's if it's a partner that's an operating partner, I look for somebody with experience and ability and time, making sure that they have the ability to execute on whatever we're trying to achieve together and then make sure that they're rewarded properly. I, I believe really in making sure people are paid well. And then if they're equitized, their partner, that their reward works meaningful enough that they can make some pretty good money alongside you. So I'm willing to give up more if they're really great at what they do. So they have the opportunity to, to earn. And if you can do that, then generally you have a good partner and a good partnership and continue to let them run, continue to let them continue to grow and take on the challenges they want to take on. And when they hit, hit those walls or they get tired, or they don't want to do things, be prepared to step in and help them take pressure off of them so that they still feel good about the relationship and, and everything they're driving forward with. We have another question right now. Let's see it. Hey guys, I just wanted to ask Mark. He has had so much success recruiting the best people and was curious if he was a GM or maybe three to four location operator, how would he recruit top talent in 2020? Thanks. That's from yeah. Cycle. Yeah, Nicholas, good question. I mean, I, I think there's going to be a lot of talent on the sidelines right now as some gyms won't come back. So I think that you'll have a chance with personal trainers and, and operations people and salespeople and management people to interview and hire. And so if you're in a position to kind of continue to bring good people into your organization, you'll find people that are looking for a long-term opportunity. You, you don't want to bring that person whose resume shows every year they've changed their job. My dad used to always, you know, tell me, look at a resume. And if someone's changing their job every six months to a year, there's something going on there. Look for somebody who's had some stability. So someone that's worked two, three, four, five years, a couple of times in their career path that they're willing to stick around. And if you can find the right person for the position you need, whether that's a, a fitness manager or whether that's ops manager, whether it's a sales manager or general manager, whatever it might be, interview and find people that have staying power. They're looking for a new home that you can compensate them equal to or greater than what they're used to making or give them the opportunity to make more. So they're excited about working for you. And then trust. Uh, a big part for me is trust. I, I don't want to work for somebody who's micromanaging me every second of every day and screaming and yelling at me. I want someone to say, hey, this is the objective. Do you agree to the objective? This is your goals. Do you agree to those goals are reasonable? I right, go achieve it. Just make it happen. And if you make it happen, you're not going to hear from me. I'm going to be there cheering you along. If you need help, I'm there for you. But I, I really don't want you know, to work for somebody that is a micro me. So if that's not your style, not to micro, then hire those people. Now, other people may need micromanagement. They want someone all over them. If that's your style, then hire people that are used to that. So you get the right people underneath you. But I do think there's going to be a lot of talent. There's going to be, as we know, unfortunately, a, a heavy unemployment number on the streets, somewhere between 20, 25% right now. They think by the end of the year it might fall to 10%. That'll be three times greater than it was in February. Right. I have to think there's going to be a lot of people on the sidelines looking to come back to an industry they can thrive in and looking to come back to an industry that they enjoy. So I think you're in a good, good spot. And an industry that can continue to expand and grow and to, just about everybody will have a fitness membership of some sort. You know, talking about resumes, I remember one time I was in Singapore and we were looking for some, I forget the position. And this gentleman was in front of me who had, very dark sunglasses and I was looking over his resume and he had a, he had a job you know throughout his 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 life except for four years that he kind of left blank and I went over it and I said okay I see all this there's a four year blank can you tell me a little bit about that and he said to me oh those four years I was in Changi prison okay well on one hand, he's being honest with me. On the other hand, he's been to prison just recently. And I said, okay, um, can I ask you why you were in prison? 
He said, oh, uh, yeah, that was assault on my previous employer. <laughs> I called Mike O'Brien, who was the manager. Said, Mike, can you take over? Because I have that, that thing right now. So at least he was honest. And uh, I mean, how many insane stories, Mark? I'm going to end with how we, before I end with Mark, do you have any other specific questions? No, no, I think that we've covered a lot of stuff. It's great. Okay, so I alluded to one time where Mark. Let me let me. I'll say one story, Mark, and then you can you can try to trump me. All right. So going back to what I said at the beginning of the show, picture uh, Mark and I are partners, and we have another partner named Patrick, and we're in uh, Apkujong in Korea. It's winter time. Not you know, it's snowing and there's ice on on the grounds, and we had an agent with us, uh, our agent who spoke. Korean because the three of us obviously don't speak Korean and our landlord of the building 80,000 80, square foot building our rent was correct me if I'm wrong Mark but pretty close to $400,000 US a month is that right? About right yeah. About right. So we were in there trying to renegotiate something probably to get the rent down and as our agent was trying to translate, and our landlord was obviously a, a gangster, you know, crazy gangster, who tried to change change the rent for us all the time. And he was powerful. I mean, he always had multiple very powerful, scary-looking bodyguards, and a couple of them were, were right around us, breathing pretty heavily at us. And then we noticed that our agent said something and kind of left to run down the elevator and take off. And uh, you and I were sitting there with these with these goons, basically. And all I can remember was ending up in this crazy karaoke bar. I don't know how we got from there. To I can tell you. I can tell you. Yeah, I can tell you exactly what happened. So we. This. I'll give you the story because you probably don't remember it all. But um, I know my. That was wife, great. Remember. Are you? What's that? You're not going to bring up the one with Craig. No. But okay. so I got a call from you and Patrick and Patrick Wee, who I love. Patrick, Patrick's crazy. He was our lawyer at the time and said, our landlord at, at Apkujong, Mr. So, Chairman So, Chairman so. Uh, needs to meet with the chairman of our company to finalize the deal terms on some issues we had open. And at the time, I think my wife was due with our first child in about four weeks. And I was on lockdown. You can't leave your house because you might be born any day. But I had to go to Korea. So I had to convince my wife, Mindy, can I go to Korea? And she finally landed so it's important to go. So I jumped a plane. I didn't want to go. I flew all the way to Korea. I landed. I came to the hotel. I took a quick shower. And you and Patrick grabbed me. And you take me to Chairman So's office. And we go inside. And he's got a bunch of guys wearing a Pulp Fiction setup. They're wearing black suits, thin black ties, white shirts. And he's sitting there. And, and it's in Korea, it's a face-to-face -face thing. It's kind of chairman to chairman. It just doesn't work any other way. Even though you're the power of all of Asia running it, you need to drag me out to meet him. And there was these two open issues. And so he took our translator and threw him out the door. He took Patrick, our lawyer, and threw him out the door. Right. And we're sitting there. And he comes around his desk and he walks up to me and he goes to talks to his, his translator, who says to me that Chairman So is very... Uh, nice to meet you. He's thanking you for coming all the way out here. And he wants to let you know that you're very handsome, like a movie star. And so I remember standing back. I said, well, thank Chairman So for having me. But let him know where I come from. Most people think I'm quite ugly. And so they translate back. Chairman So laughs very hard. And he says, OK, you know, we need to get to business. We have these two open issues. We need you to do this and this. And I said, no, we're not doing either one. Sorry. He translates back. And Chairman So says, OK, fine. And you look at me. I look at you and we're done. He said, okay, now we go to dinner. So he takes us to dinner. We're drinking sogu, which is like, you know, like this sake. And he pours me a sogu. He's got like 15 guys around him. It's just me, you, and Patrick. And we take the shot of, of sake. Okay, fine. And then I start talking and everybody's looking at me like, you know, I'm, not, I'm doing something wrong. And Patrick says, you need to pour sogu back. Oh, okay. So I pour him one. Well, every time he pours you one, you have to pour him one back. Well, that went on throughout the whole dinner. We probably had 15 of them. And by then, you don't know where you are. And they said that the only way this party ends is if you can make him pass out. 
So then we did the American way. We basically threw it over our shoulder and poured him another one until eventually he was done and left and we got to go back to our hotel. But that was the whole thing. But the, the moral of the story was, as I know you got to wrap up here, is that I had my son, Mason, my wife and I, our first child. And about three weeks later, I get this FedEx package out of the blue from Korea. Open up. It's got an envelope with a note from Chairman So and 10 $100 bills saying, congratulations on the birth of your son. And he gave us $1,000 to start his like college fund. So that's the Korean style, the Korean way. So those are some crazy stories we've had. But, you know, we became good friends, Chairman So and I and you. And every time I went up to Korea, he was an, a very gracious host and an amazing guy. Um, so we had a lot of fun with him over the years in Korea. And we really have no idea how close we came to being assassinated. That oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there was, a, there was a, a, an edge there. But fortunately, I was an ugly American movie star. And I think that helped out. <laughs> well, we you did you saved us on that that time and a few other ones that we'll have you back. We'll just we'll just talk about the insane times that we've had and why we don't ask why anymore and all yeah. the things we've been through, tanks down the street, coups, the uh, works. I wanna, and, I, wanna, I wanna tell the story about Craig Pepin and I getting hit by the monkey in the zoo in Thailand. I mean that's gonna everybody's gonna laugh for a week once I tell that story. Multiple times the monkey was after him. Hey, times that monkey got you. Now, I'm going to tell the story one day, and the whole world's going to know, and it's going to be a, it's going to be a movie. He was <laughs> way the monkey was going to eat him alive. But and anyway, you heard, you heard the you heard the Tiger King. Craig's going to beat it. He's going to be the monkey. Yeah, king. Makes it, that Tiger King look like you know Walt Disney. But Mark, you're the best, and it's a big honor to have you on the show. Yeah, it's fitness gorillas. And Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Howie, always great to see you, Howie. Great to see you. Thank you. Everything. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. All right, guys. Well, that yeah. was unbelievable. Great show. And we're he, knows see more. Oh, he, he knows about every yeah. he knows about every aspect of the business. And I mean, he he's still running such a big cup. I mean, he's he's running crunch. I think they have how many locations did Craig say? Three hundred and forty or something. Yeah. He's, Something like that. Right. He's still the chairman of that UFC, right? All the UFC gyms. He is uh, the boss of that with Adam Sedlak. And uh, he's still doing everything. He can do it all. Yeah. You know, when he, when he uh, built the Sacramento Kings Arena, he never talked about it. Go there, and it's like the most modern and crazy, beautiful arena. He doesn't talk. And, again, like he said, not only is he that and that and that and that, He's the best father in the world. I mean, I've seen I've seen him raise the four kids. They're all unbelievable. He's got uh, the best wife, of course. Joy's the best, but Mindy's Mindy's wonderful and uh, great. Yeah, yeah great. super interesting guy. I mean, I've known him for quite a while myself, but uh, you have a lot more to deal with him. But I mean, uh, very nice, very interesting. I hope everyone listening, and we had a lot of interaction here with a lot of questions, which is good. And, and I want to see how it's Friday. We're going to bring him back. Yeah, and on Friday, I mean, we're, we're having a really another special guest, Mr. David King, who was the first person in the private equity world to invest in the fitness industry. And he, Mark, either found him or he, he found Mark. I'm not sure exactly that. We'll ask him. But Mark and, and David together brought 24-hour Nautilus to 24-hour fitness to $1.8 billion. He's going to talk about finding money, how to how to sell your company, and everything else. He's another. Yeah, well, we want to know what he thinks of the current situation and how right. people are going to find money now also. And that's Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific time for the Fitness Gorillas. Yeah, so please. Have to say goodbye now. Yeah, please come and watch that show. And. Thank you for for joining us, and I know you really enjoyed Mark Mashoff. So, right. see you on Friday.